views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Come up on this edition of Perspectives. My next guest is pretty passionate about the Constitution, the Supreme Court, as well as voting rights. But now we're here to talk about a new book, The Journeys Through the Invasion of Africa, the Colonial Period, and the Civil Rights Movement, as well as the role Black women played in the quest for liberty. Stay tuned. You're watching Perspectives with yours truly, Darren Ivey. What's on your mind? What's on your mind? What's on your mind? Anything relevant to life, you bring it to the table. Whether you're making moves solo or a movement with a stable. No fables, just speak on your decisions. Because in the long run, it's your voice, your views, your vision. Keeping it real with many messages for you to know. This ain't radio, but DJ runs the show. Entertainment, he rocks it. Politics, he locks it. The host with the most would handle any topic. Don't forget to share your perspective with Shines of Light. Because it might make a difference in someone else's life. Make a difference in someone's life. Express what's in your heart and your mind. Share your perspective. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Perspectives. I am Darren Hyman. Of course, we thank you for joining us. And as always, you can watch Perspectives on Bronx. That's Channel 67. Optimum, that's channel 2133, and anytime on the web at bronxnet.org. We also encourage you to stay, to stay tuned and connected to us via all of our social media platforms at Bronxnet TV. If you're looking for, for me personally, my website, or I should say my Facebook page, Darren C. Jaime, that's the professional page, and then DC Jaime 23 on Instagram and Twitter. And uh, yeah, DC Jaime, uh, Darren C. Jaime as the website. You can check that out in the future. Uh, it'll be launching in 2021. Well, listen, coming front and center on the show, I'm pleased to be joined by an, our very special guest. She joins me. She's a woman that spent all of her life literally on the teaching and education platform, teaching black history, the Constitution, uh, criminal justice, racial prejudices. She's the associate professor of constitutional law at John Jay College, a civil rights attorney, and the founder of the Law and Policy Group. And she is also the author of many books, including the U.S. Constitution and African-American Context, as well as a new book that she has out that's entitled She Took Justice. She's also a playwright and has a reading of her new play out on YouTube called Shop Caught a Soul. I'm here to be joined by Gloria Brown Marshall. And again, glad to have you back here on the show. And uh, yes, you are keeping busy. I'm trying to stay out of prison. Yeah, I think that's everybody's trying to either stay safe. Others are saying stay out of prison, but we want people to stay connected to the show so they can find out all about uh, your work. Thanks for being with us and uh, sharing with us. Uh, but listen, let's talk a little bit about your work these days. Um, and, you know, well, let's do this first. Let's talk what we all know, right? Politics. There's a new president-elect coming, uh, President-elect Joe Biden. Uh, and after defeating President Donald Trump, we just recently heard from the Electoral College, and you yourself had recently wrote an article about the Electoral College. So before we get into everything else, talk to me about that. Uh, and you're just, first of all, just your takeaways. Well, you know, usually we don't even hear about the Electoral College. It's something that um, takes place behind the scenes after the national election takes place the first week of November. But however, given the fact that Donald Trump said coming into the national election that he was not going to step down from office because um, he just felt like there was going to be some type of, you know, shenanigans or some type of trickery or fraud. And so now we see that he, in his mind, does not believe he lost the election. And um, because uh, President Barack Obama had two terms, I guess he felt that by some pigmentation, he was supposed to have um, two terms as well. So this figment of fraud has been rebuffed by the U.S. Supreme Court several times, as well as state courts and federal courts. There's no evidence of any fraud. He just wants to taint the water. And so this required us to now look into the Electoral College and understand how it works. And so there are federal laws and as well as the U.S. Constitution, Article 2, uh, Section 
too, goes into the Electoral College and the fact that there is this balance between the popular vote and the electors. And the electors are actually just political people. There's not a college. There's a group of people who come together, as we saw, take place, and they vote for the most part based on whether or not the, a particular pre uh, presidential candidate won the most votes for that state. And that then becomes the number of votes based on the number of U.S. representatives and senators from that state. That's how we get 538. And that's the number that is the number of the Electoral College, 538. And that's the number of, of the representatives from that state and their two senators. The number of- I'm sorry, keep going. The number of, of U.S. senators and the U.S. representatives from that state equals the number of electors from that state. And so 270 is the majority that a person needs to get as president, um, as a candidate to win um, that, um, that office. And so each state's electors then gives that vote count to the Congress. Here's the tricky part. Under the federal laws that are in place, that means that the vice president, Mike Pence, is the person who becomes president of a joint session of Congress. That means the U.S. representatives and the senators come together and they then, you know, count all of the electoral votes that have been sent to them from the individual states. That is overseen by the vice president, in this case, Mike Pence. And then the vice president, who becomes president of the Senate under this very unique circumstance, makes the announcement as to who is the next president. So, Darren, what happens is Mike Pence is going to have to announce that Joe Biden yeah. is the next president of the United States. Yeah, it's going to be, it's gonna be, pretty, it's gonna be pretty intense. That's going to be January 6th, and we're going to see if he is going to follow law, the Constitution, as well as, you know, the, the president and tradition of this of this country, or is he going to probably be told by Donald Trump, as he's been his lapdog all of this four years, not to do what has traditionally be done, been done. And I'll tell you how deep this is. When Al Gore and, and um, George Bush fought over Florida, and Florida's mm -hmm. vote that would then, you know, because the U.S. Supreme Court stopped the vote count in Florida, the hanging sheds, and right. then George Bush became president. Remember, Al Gore was vice president at the time. So in that situation, Al Gore did the same thing. He had to become president of the joint session, oversee the vote count, and announce that his nemesis and opponent, George W. Bush, was president of the United States. But he did it in 2001. So we'll see if, you know, the audacity we've seen thrown in the face of the Constitution and our traditions by both Donald Trump and Mike Pence will continue. Will they actually allow Mike Pence to do what he's supposed to do, which is to announce the vote? And also, we rarely have challenges of the Electoral College. And so on January 6th, they might also challenge the vote count of the Electoral College during this joint session. Um, so a number of things might happen that we never think about because we usually just say the vote happened in November. The president is the president elect and we move on to January 20th when the inauguration takes place. But this yeah. time there's going to be a lot of intrigue around something that's considered, considered very boring, which is the Electoral College. It'll be the first time the Electoral College in a long time has been making um, a lot of, of news. Well, enough about them. Let's talk about you. How about that? Right behind you, we just saw the last shot. Uh, you've got a book out, and that book is called She Took Justice. And uh, for people who may not be so familiar, uh, we know that you're an author, and you're very passionate about some things. But talk to us about what's behind She Took Justice, and what can we expect? Well, you know, I'm this corny, pointed headed professor when it comes to the Constitution, and I like people to be empowered by it. And then I was shamed when I was doing my book, Race, Law, and American Society, I was working on that in the research, and I found all these Black women, Black fierce women in our history, we knew nothing about, I knew I knew nothing about them. And I said, oh my goodness, as much as I care about law and empowerment in the Constitution, these women were already empowered even during the time period of enslavement. 
And so I had to step back and gather up my research and figure out how to talk about these women and she took justice. And I even got the title from Sojourner Truth. People know about Sojourner Truth generally, but did people know that Sojourner Truth actually had four lawsuits? four lawsuits and she won each and every one of them. And this is in the 1800s during the time period of enslavement. So these fierce women from the 1600s all the way up, I go from Queen and Zinga who actually negotiated a peace treaty in 1622. This is an African Angolan queen, Queen and Zinga, warrior queen. And she's negotiating as a diplomat this peace treaty that the Portuguese, of course, broke, but she was negotiating this in 1622. So I start with Queen Nzinga in Africa and I go up to Shirley Chisholm and just talk about these amazing women in American history who have used law, who have confronted law, opposed law and, and taken law to make their careers. And that whole trajectory of how fierce these African American women have been is something that I feel is so important for us to know. So she took justice, the black woman law and power is the book. Yeah. Uh, you know, so many times we're introduced to, you know, the traditional ones, the Harriet Tubman's, the Sojourner Truth. People, and don't get me wrong, and, and very credible and very much a, a huge contribution to society. Why does history get lost on the side of these other people who we don't know so much about, but thank God for people like you who bring them to the forefront? Well, and also when we look at Kamala Harris, and I have a note in the beginning of the book to, to Kamala Harris. We see that she didn't just arrive out of nowhere. Women, Black women have been this fierce for all of this time. We didn't get created in the last 20 years. So these fierce Black intellectuals, writers, poets, civil rights activists, community organizers, they've been there and they've been fighting tooth and nail for their part of the of the of this world to be recognized and even when they weren't recognized by other women by white men and even by brothers sometimes black men did not support a lot of these black women i mean they, they continued also despite everything so fighting against racism and sexism and i think she took justice is a book that would inspire all people who read about those fighting against the odds yeah i want to talk a little bit more with glory brown marshall as we are sharing more about her work, She Took Justice. And then there's also more that she's got in the arsenal. Talk about She Took Justice. She took a whole lot and made a whole lot out of it. I'm telling you right now, stay with us here on Perspectives. back here on Perspectives. Darren Jaime here with you. We are continuing our conversation with Dr. Gloria Brown Marshall as she continues to educate us on her new writing, She Took Justice, and uh, talking about the work of African-American women when it comes to law, uh, justice. And I want to ask you, uh, Gloria, talk to me a little bit about Black women. Talk to me about Black America. And talk to me about law. Because many will make the argument that when it comes to law, law has not always been on the side and law has not favored Black America. That is so true. Law has been used more as a tool of oppression than a weapon of liberation. And I go through this in my book because I span generations of time. But we need to know that Black women understood that law was being used against them. And so back in 1619, when the 20 and odd Africans arrived in the Virginia colony, there were women and girls in that group of 20 Africans. And then to continuously have 
black women and girls come into that colony. And with that, they brought skills. They brought their ability not only to learn the language, but to navigate the, the culture, the, the temperature, the commerce, all of these things black women did. So some of the first lawsuits brought by black women were back in the 1600s and 1650s. There were black women who were fighting for their freedom by using law, getting an attorney and suing. It's the American way, right? So <laughs> Yes, black women were suing for their freedom. There were black women in the Salem witch trials. Three black women, part of the Salem witch trials. Some people know about the black woman who uh, allegedly started the Salem witch trials when they accused her of witchcraft. They were there were two other black women also accused of witchcraft, and none of them died. And you know why they didn't? Because they were creative and they understood that they had to navigate this system. So here you have these enslaved women, and they said, "Are you a witch?" And she said, no, I'm not a witch. Then they saw like the white women who said, no, they're not a witch, get burned at the stake and so or get hanged. So they asked the black woman again, are you a witch? It's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, I'm a witch. Yeah. So, we'll confess your sins. OK, <laughs> and that's how they lived because they had to outwit people they knew were crazy. And this is what black women have had to do. If I had to do it in the say it in the vernacular, it's what black women have had to do. They had to take the tools being used against them study those tools and say, ah, I see how, you, how you're doing this. Now I'm going to take what you used against me and I'm going to use it against you. That even the written word, think about Phyllis, Phyllis Wheatley. Everyone knows about Phyllis Wheatley, right? That she was the first black female published poet in the 1700s. But did you know that Phyllis Wheatley had to go to trial? She had to prove at a hearing that she was capable of writing her own poems. So when I'm talking about these different ways in which law is being used, I think about Elizabeth Freeman, whose name was Mum Bet, who saw the Massachusetts Constitution. They're arguing about freedom in front of her as they did. Thomas Jefferson, all these people wrote these documents we praise in front of enslaved people. This black woman said, I'm enslaved. I'm working for a white woman who's beating me and beating my sister and, and treating us horribly. She walked into a lawyer's office and said, you're talking about freedom using this document? I, I want to use that document, make me free, and started a lawsuit and won her freedom in the 1780s. So before we had, um, you know, Rosa Parks, as you pointed out, we had Sarah Roberts, who in 1854, you know, brought her and her father, a black lawyer, brought um, a lawsuit allowing her or forcing her or trying to get her to be a part of a desegregation of the white schools in Boston, Massachusetts. She didn't win that case, but that case becomes famous. And so we've had so many other, we have Celia in that case, she killed her master who was raping her, you know, killed him and went to, and it was a criminal court case and black women, no people of color were allowed to testify in, on their own behalf in court. So when we talk about even in the 1900s and the black women who fought for voting rights, and of course we know Fannie Lou Hamer and so many, but there are others who we know, know about, nothing about. And so right. I want you to know about those women. It's important. I mean, it's important for us to know about these women. And I want to encourage viewers, please get her book. Uh, it's called She Took Justice, The Black Woman Law and Power. It's currently available on Amazon. So if you have an opportunity to go to Amazon, go to Amazon, get the book, support the book. Uh, I'm definitely going to be a proponent of letting you know that in 2021, it's about knowing your history um, and knowing your destiny, because you can't know your destiny until you know your history. And Gloria Brown Marshall helping us with that. She took justice. But Gloria, in addition to that, I got to really uh, talk about your other work as well, because uh, you're doing some film work. And uh, you got a you got a film called Shot. Uh, and people don't know, Shot Caught a Soul. Uh, it's a play by Gloria. And uh, Gloria, tell us a little bit about that one. Well, I, I've written and been disturbed and, of course, angered by the number of Black people shot by police and the lack of legal foundation for protection. The fact that these standards are so low that the Supreme Court has set that allow a government person to kill a civilian and not have to explain the facts of that, that murder and sometimes not even get like the, the film of it. So I said, I'm going to use my, my work as a theater artist, as a playwright. And I've been a playwright for a, probably longer than I've been a lawyer. And so I wrote this play, Shot, and it's about caught, catching a soul. That when, when that police officer shot this Black teenager, when the white cop did that, and explains to people why he did it. Because this soul could not rest 
the black teenager could not rest until he actually went to that cop and asked him why. And so in this very short play, I have this teenager in this cop's head. And so this cop cannot take himself away, cannot rest away from what he has done. And in the end, the teenager gets the power of God Almighty in his soul and then presses this cop until the cop finally confesses as to what he actually did because he felt he had the power to do it. And that's what happens with so many of these shootings. It's because these white cops have the power to take a life and they know there's no consequence. And so there's got to be, even if it's not a legal consequence up to this point, there's got to be a spiritual consequence. And that's what SHOT is about. The spirit spiritual consequence of the continuous murder of African-Americans by our government. One thing, quick break, but coming up after the break, you'll have an opportunity coming out of the break to see a clip from SHOT. Darren Jaime, you're watching Perspectives. We'll be right back in a few. you to get down stop resisting and get on the ground that's what i told you in trouble you look like trouble from the first look shots fired. repeat shots fired 1052 ambulance needed suspect down yeah damn ain't no ambulance needed man I'm dead. And there you saw a shot, a play by Gloria Brown Marshall. And uh, Gloria, when we talk about watching something like this, um, for many of us, this is like deja vu. It is. I mean, I, I thought about the fact that my brother's name is Michael Brown. And I lived in the Midwest, was a born and raised Midwesterner before I moved out to New York. Um, and married a New Yorker. And my my feeling was I could understand, you know, that the, the shock of it, Michael Brown's body lying in the street um, in Ferguson, Missouri, um, Tamir Rice, so many of these African-Americans again and again and again. And I said, but we never get to tell our story. The law is not allowing us to go into court because it's not bringing these officers into the courtroom, asking them, how and why did you fear for your life? What element of this brought you a fear enough to use deadly force? We never get that satisfaction of actually having this officer go before a jury of their peers and speak. They always talk about, oh, I'd rather be um, judged by nine than carried by six. And it's like, but you never get judged by nine. You right. never get into court. Rarely, with uh, over a thousand people are killed by the by police every year, and we've just started keeping those, those those stats on that. The FBI wasn't even keeping stats on it. So I was like, okay, now you explain to me in my play. And so I actually went into the different reasons officers have given, and you'll hear them in my play. So it's not like this is a person that you're not going to understand. You are. I made them a very full person. So it's not like, you know, just going to beat up on the white officer. No, I want the white officer character in my play to explain himself, to show himself as a fully rounded human being, but would also allow that teenager to question 
or cross-examine this officer on why the officer did what he did. And in the end, it was because he could. And it was because it was racial prejudice. For, for viewers right now who are saying, listen, I, I like what I see. I want to be able to see this. What do they do? How, how are they able to watch this? Well, what we're doing right now, this has been so exciting. It's like I'm, I'm looking for grant money so that we can take this to the next level. I made it short, like 30 minutes, so that it can be shown in, in schools and be a part of a discussion. I think it opens up the, the ability for people to have real deep discussions about this. This is what's happened so far. And so if they contact me and they can contact me at law and policy group at hotmail.com, that's law, L-A-W and A-N-D policy group at hotmail.com. And so we can, you know, find what people want to do with it and how they want to show this film and to their groups. So that's what we're doing right now. Yeah. Well, when we talk about these deaths that are really horrific and we watch in our community, this happened time and time and time again. Spike Lee has a movie coming out uh, that's dealing with the same thing. Uh, talking about that. Having that on film, Talk about the takeaway, because there is a huge takeaway that you want people to have in this experience. It's a lived experience, an experience that's just too painful. Uh, and, I, and I'll be honest, you know, when somebody tells me about another horrific shooting, sometimes I don't even go. It took me forever to watch George Floyd, because the scenes are all too familiar. They're, you know, and watching Walter Scott being shot in the back, I mean, I, I, I report on these things, as you know. I, I, I cover the U.S. Supreme Court. I report on major legal, legal cases for a lot of media sources and platforms. What bothers me is like the fact that we don't get to speak, that we are supposed to not be outraged by this as people of color. And all we're supposed to just accept this as a consequence of our pigment and our culture. And so I rebel against that. And sometimes it can lead to me being frustrated and even depressed like other people. But so I channel it into this artwork in which in my play shot, the, the spirit of this teenager reigns supreme. The spirit of the conquest that has allowed us, as in my book, She Took Justice, to live this long is a spirit that comes up and says, I am not going to sit here and just let you do this. And that's the spirit of the protesters who have been protesting out in the cold and the pandemic all this time. That spirit is going to live on and that spirit demands justification. We would not be able to be on this show right now, Darren, but for the spirit that has forced us through litigation, legislation and protest to demand more out of this country. And so even when we get weary, that's why they make the next generations to come in here and keep it moving, but it must keep moving. We stand on the shoulders of ancestors and we have to make sure in their name that we don't get so tired because tired is a privilege. We can get a little weary and take a break, but we can't sit down. You have to do what has to be done in whatever medium. And so in this play shot caught a soul, we not only see the spirit of this teenager, this black teenager rise up supreme at the end, we also see the fall of the officer. And so I, I need us to understand that these officers are living with this. They're living with the murder they've committed because it is this cold blooded murder that they feel they can get away with, but they're not. They're spiritually depraved and that deprivation is going to eat them away. And that is part of the, what I wrote in my play shot. Yeah. Glory Brown Marshall, we're going to leave it there. Our viewers know how to reach you and certainly best wishes on shot and also sheets of justice. Make sure you go to Amazon, check out our book. Dr. Gloria Brown Marshall, our guest here on Perspectives. Love having you. Thank you. All righty. Well, we'll let you know we are out of show, but listen, make sure you tune in next week for a brand new episode of Perspectives. I'm Darren Jaime. Until next time we meet, stay safe and share your perspective with somebody else. It just might make a difference in someone else's life.